We graphed our three primary ratios. Now we're going to graph our three secondary ratios, or our reciprocal ratios. Um, so cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. I have graphed out for us here already the graph of sine. So this is what the graph of sine should look like. This can help you with uh, extending your graphs as well. This is what your graph should have looked like. Um, remember that sine and cosine are always going mountain, valley, mountain, valley. Um, and the important points that we marked off previously were these points here. And then we also marked off the halves and negative halves, which happen at, so this is the half and the negative half. They happen all along here. You can actually see them right on the graph here. And we'll just mark them off. These are going to be some important points that we'll use. And then I'm going to graph them in the negative section. I'll just mark off all of these ones in the negative section as well. So zeros, halves, negative halves, and ones and negative ones. That's all the points that I'm marking off here. So when I go to graph the reciprocal functions, here are the rules for graphing all the reciprocal functions. So you will start with the graph of your primary function. So for cosecant, we start with sine. For secant, we start with cos, and so on. So either graph the primary ratio or at least have the points of the primary ratio. Once you've done that, for your reciprocal, the x's will all stay the same. So I'm going to keep all of the x's of the sine function. I will do the reciprocal of all the y's. Okay, and that's because sine is equal to the reciprocal of cosecant, and cosecant is equal to the reciprocal of sine. So that means if I reciprocal all the y's, I'll have all the y coordinates for cosecant. And what's going to happen here is if I have, for instance, y's that are, if my y is negative 1, what's the reciprocal of that? Which is? Okay, what's the reciprocal of 1? 1. What's the reciprocal of 0? Undefined. Because if we move 0 into a denominator, that's going to become a vertical asymptote. It will be undefined. How about a half? 2. two. So halves become 2s. And what about a negative half? Negative 2. OK, so if all the x's are staying the same, all of these points are going to stay lined up with the same x's. I'm just going to take each of these y's, and I'm going to flip them into these values, right? We'll do the reciprocals. So negative 1's and 1's will all stay the same, right? Because the reciprocal of negative 1 and positive 1 is negative 1 and positive 1. So look at all your 1's and negative 1's. Those will stay the same. I'm going to mark these off in green. This is the same. This is the same, this will stay the same, and this will stay the same. And that's all the negative ones and ones I can see. Zeros, I'm going to mark off vertical asymptotes where any x's um, have y's that are 0. So that's all the x-intercepts. All of these right here are going to become vertical asymptotes of my reciprocal function. So we're going to mark off dotted lines right along here. OK, and then we have all these halves and negative halves that we've graphed here. The reciprocals of halves and negative halves are 2's and negative 2's. So these are going to stay in line with the x's that they are lined up with on the x-axis. But the halves will become 2's. So halves become 2's. Negative halves become negative 2's. So I'm going to put them down here. So make sure they stay in line with where they are right now. This will be down here. So I'm just going to make all of these halves and negative halves, twos and negative twos. OK, 
Okay, and we don't need these arrows. I'm just kind of showing that they're staying in line with where they have to be. Okay, so that's our new graph. I'm going to connect them though. Um, so what ends up happening is our graph will sort of curve in between the asymptotes here, and it looks like little parabolas almost in between here. This one, we don't see all of it. It's going to just be like a part of it there on the ends. So that's what it looks like. Obviously, without the graph of sine in there, right? So for domain and range, I want you to notice, so domain can be anything except these asymptotes. These asymptote values are negative 2 pi, negative 1 pi, 0, 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi, 6 pi, and so on. So multiples of pi, where pi is an integer. So we're going to say, we're going to use this method for this one. We're going to say x can be anything, except we don't want x to be the asymptote value. So we don't want x to be any multiple of pi, where k is a whole number integer, or 0, right? For range, my graph goes forever downward and forever upward, but there is a section in the middle that my graph doesn't go along. It happens from here to here, right? My graph is not in between here. So I need to exclude the values from negative 1 to 1. So it's actually the inverse of what the domain is for the original, or the range is for the original function. So I'm going to say, Range will be all numbers, except we want to exclude from negative 1 to 1. So I can say from 1 and above, so where y is greater than or equal to 1, and negative 1 and below, so where y is less than or equal to negative 1. OK, so I'm just excluding the values in between negative 1 and 1. It's the reverse of what sine is. For secant, it's the exact same thing, except obviously the asymptotes will happen in different locations, and the halves and negative halves will all happen in different locations. So same rules here. Let's mark off the important points. All the ones, negative ones and zeros, we'll mark those off. And then we'll mark off all the halves and negative halves as well. So the halves and negative halves are happening like, make sure they're in line with where y is a half. Okay, so these are just the points of the original function of cos x, and we're going to use this to graph secant x. So first things first, ones and negative ones will stay the same. So you're going to mark off where all the y's are ones and where all the y's are negative ones, and those will be points of the new function. So one, there's a negative one, there's a one, there's a negative one, and there's another one. Zeros become asymptotes. So any x-intercepts that you see, we're going to draw asymptotes, vertical asymptotes along there. Okay, so it's happening at all the x-intercepts. They become vertical asymptotes for the new function. 
And then all those halves and negative halves that you marked off, those become twos and negative twos. So just make sure you keep them in line with where they are now, because the x's will stay the same. Because we're doing the reciprocals, so the reciprocal of one half is two when we flip it, and the reciprocal of negative half is negative two. So we're graphing the reciprocal function, right? So we're reciprocaling all the y coordinates of the primary function. Okay, sine and cosine look very similar to one another, and that's why secant and cosecant should also look very similar to one another. So we're just going to get these little parabola looking guys in between all the asymptotes, same as we did for cosecant. So that's the graph of secant. The graph of secant has asymptotes happening at negative 3 pi over 2, negative 1 pi over 2, 1 pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, and so on. So the domain of this is actually going to be the same as what we did for the domain of tan. It's going to be all real numbers for x, but x should not equal k multiples of pi over 2, uh, where k is an integer and where k is odd. Okay, so essentially we're just saying whole odd multiples of pi over 2. Negative 3, negative 1, 1, 3, 2, 5 over 2, 5 pi over 2, 7 pi over 2, and so on. The range of this is the same as the range for um, cosecant. So we can't have values in between negative 1 and 1. So we're just going to say that y must be greater than 1 or equal to 1. And it must be less than or equal to negative 1. 1 and up, and negative 1 and down. OK, so main rules here. These are the rules that you're going by. Graph the primary. Keep the x's the same. Reciprocal all of the y coordinates. OK? Ones and, ones and negative ones will stay the same. Zeros become vertical asymptotes. Halves and negative halves become twos and negative twos. OK? Let's look at graphing cotangent. So cotangent, I have tan graphed here. We're going to do the same thing. So ones and negative ones will stay the same. So any negative one will stay as negative one. Any ones will stay as ones. What if I reciprocal a vertical asymptote? What does that become? Clayton? Mm. So let's look up here. A zero became a vertical asymptote. So if I reciprocal a vertical asymptote? Zero. Yes. So Clayton, you're thinking inverse. That's different than reciprocal, right? OK, so vertical asymptotes become zeros. And zeros become vertical asymptotes here. OK, so I'm going to mark off all the ones and negative ones on tan and all the zeros. OK, let's mark off all these y coordinates. So here's a zero, here's a zero, uh, here's a zero, here's a zero, and then a negative one, positive one. Oh, and there's a zero. Here's a positive one, here's a negative one, here's a positive one, here is a negative one. And same thing here. OK, so I marked off all the, all the x-intercepts, which are zeros, all the negative ones, and all the positive ones. OK, just making sure that they line up with 1 on the y-axis and negative 1 down here on the y-axis.
All right, ones and negative ones stay the same. So you're going to mark off all the ones and negative ones and make sure that those stay the same. Those are going to be points on our reciprocal function because when I reciprocal one and negative one, they stay as one and negative one. All the x-intercepts that I just marked off become vertical asymptotes. So this becomes a vertical asymptote of my new graph. Same thing here, same thing here, same thing here, and here. And the vertical asymptotes, which are marked off here in blue, the vertical asymptotes of tan become the x-intercepts of our new function. They become zeros. So I'm going to mark off at all these blue lines here, I'm going to mark off an x-intercept for each of these. So here, 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 and here. This looks kind of confusing with both graphs right now, but look at the red points. Basically what has happened now is that the graph of cotangent is sort of like the graph of tangent, but almost like in reverse, right? Instead of going up toward the right, it goes down toward the right. And the asymptotes are in new locations as well. Okay, so that's what your new graph should look like. Actually, maybe I will just highlight the new graph as well, just so that we can see it a little bit more clearly. Maybe I won't, because I can't get down there. No, it's not going to let me. All right, so the domain. Notice that our new asymptotes are all happening at, whoops, negative 2 pi, negative pi, 0, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi, and so on. This is the same domain as what we had for cosecant. So all I need to say is that x should not equal multiples of pi where, pi is an, uh, where k is an integer. So whole number or a negative number, right? Whole positive or negative number. The range for this, notice that our graph is going down forever and up forever. Are there any gaps in between that? So range is just everything, right? We'll just say all real numbers, or you can say negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay, so there's no homework for this part. The part is just understanding the graphs, right? So there's no... There's nothing you can do, like, I mean, you can re-graph the primary ratios and the secondary ratios to practice, but there's nothing really more than that that we can do for practice for these things. It's just understanding where these things came from, okay? So our second part for today is just uh, intro, reintroduction, or just a refreshing of transformations. Um, same as what we did in grade 11, but just with radians this time. So this, consider this kind of just like a review of what we did in grade 11. Um, okay, so graph features for sine x, or we will also use this interchangeably with cos x, um, and the transformations, okay? So exactly the same as what we've done all through grade 11. Who remembers what the a value can do to our graph? Clayton? Perfect, so vertical, it can be a reflection, it can be a stretch, it can be a compression. Okay, what about the k value? Maybe I should label this as a. Clayton, uh, Keaton? Uh, or? Okay, so k can cause a horizontal reflection, stretch, or compression.
Okay, we also reviewed this back in polynomials, so I'm sort of assuming that people are familiar with this at this point. D value? Clayton? Okay, so horizontal shift, so it goes left or right, and Z value. Vertical shift, so up or down. All right, so thinking back to grade 11, we haven't reviewed this part yet this year. Thinking back to grade 11, the absolute value of A will give us the amplitude of the periodic function. What does absolute value mean again? Someone remind us. Kenzie? Just makes everything positive, yeah. Okay, the K value. So in degrees, we said that uh, K was equal to 360 over the period. In radians, we say that the k value is equal to, um, or let's just say the period, we can find the period by doing um, 2 pi over k. And I should say absolute value of k as well, because it's the positive version of k. Usually k won't be negative anyways, but... Okay, so it was 360 over K, uh, or sorry, K over 360 is what it was, so sorry, flip that for me. Let me just think. If K equals 360 over period, oh my goodness, I have to make sure that I do this, right? I, I'm just having a brain block here. Let me just refresh my memory here. I just want to make sure I don't say it wrong. Okay, no, I was right the first time. <laughs> Should trust myself. So 2 pi over k, I was right. Keaton. So the absolute value, like the small thing? Yep. Makes, makes everything positive, yep. Okay, d, when we refer to this in terms of sine and cosine periodic functions, we call this a phase shift. It's the same thing, it just means left and right shift. Um, and C, when we refer to this in terms of, again, those sinusoidal functions, sine and cosine periodic functions, we would refer to C as the vertical displacement. And C is also the midline of the graph. And what I mean by that is, is it's the graph, it's the part of the graph that separates out where the top and bottom are equally. So if I were to think about my wave function, the C value is actually this line that goes directly in between the mountains and valleys. Okay, that's what we call the midline. And this is not a great picture because my valley looks lower than my mountain is tall, but you guys get the idea. It's halfway in between the max and min. We should say that. All right, so that's your quick sort of recap. Um, this is new, right, because this is, it was 360 over K. Now it's in radians, so it's 2 pi over K, but same idea as what we did last year. Okay, so let's just recap with this one. List the transformations and the graph feature of the wave function. I'm just going to do this in the same format that we see above. So graph feature of 5 and transformation of 5 when a is 5. What is a multiple of 5 for a due to our graph transformations wise? Bella? Okay. This is a vertical stretch. And usually we'll say by a factor of whatever the A value is, right? So I'm just going to say BAFO by a factor of 5. How about the graph feature? What would the graph feature tell us about the wave function? Kenzie? Yeah, so if I take the absolute value of A, I'm just taking the absolute value of 5, which it's already positive anyways, so it'll just be 5. 
So the amplitude here equals 5. What this is telling me is that my graph has from the midline to the max is 5 units and from the midline to the minimum is also 5 units. Okay, 3 over 2 for k. This is 1.5, so this is a value greater than 1. Does anyone remember what this would do to our graph? Clayton? Close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Graph feature. Can use this to help us find the period, right? What do I need to do? do 2 pi over 3 over 2, or absolute value of 3 over 2, which is just 3 over 2, right? So I'm just going to put it in as 3 over 2. And when you flip and multiply, you'll get 4 pi over 3 as the period. Okay, I'll just flip 3 over 2, and I'll get 2 over 3, 2 pi times 2 is 4 pi over 3. Kenzie? Yep. Yep, so you'll have a full mountain and valley every 4 pi over 3 rotation. Okay, last parts here. This is going to be a shift left pi over 2 units. Or as the graph feature, we would call this a phase shift. Pi over 2 units to the left. Okay, very similar for that one. And then the last one, shift up 7 units. Okay, or vertical displacement of positive 7. up 7. Okay, we also know the midline of the graph is at 7, right? It's that middle part. So literally, guys, the only different part is this. And then obviously these are in radians as well, so that's a slightly, a little tweak. Um, but still the same idea of like shifts, stretches, compressions, all that kind of stuff. Okay, our last part today, and then you guys will have some time to practice, is using that information to find the equation from a graph. Okay, we're almost there. I know it's a lot today. Um, okay, so amplitude, again, this is also still just review, except for the, extra, the, the radian part. So this is just, consider this a refreshing of your memory so that you can do it in radians. Um, amplitude is max minus min over 2. Vertical shift or midline, max plus min over 2. So can somebody tell me what the max is of this graph? Clayton? Okay, max is 3. Min? Kenzie? Okay, so max is 3. Min, negative 1. I can calculate A and C from that quickly here. So A is max minus min over 2. I will do max minus min over 2. I'll get 4 over 2, which will give me 2. There's my A value. Done. Second thing I can get is the midline, the C value, by doing max plus min over 2. So 3 plus negative 1 over 2. 2 over 2 is 1. I'm going to pencil that midline onto my graph. That's going to help me find the shifts. Now we're going to use the period to help us find k. So if the period, which we usually denote as b, um, so if you see b, that means period, um, 
if b equals 2 pi over k, then if I rearrange the formula, k equals 2 pi over the period. Keaton, question? Why not p? I mean, you can do it as p if you want. It's fine with me. So period, can someone remind us, what is the period of a sinusoidal function? What would I be looking for in my wave function to measure the period? Rebecca? Yeah, so one full wave. So Bella, can you add to that? OK, so one option is, is I can measure from midline to midline, making sure I have a max and min included in there. So I can measure from there to there. I can measure from a min to a min. That would be a full cycle. And I can measure from a max to a max as well. They should all be the same no matter what, right? Um, I think this one's probably easiest if we just measure from min to min because there's a zero on, there's a minimum at zero. So here's our period right here. It's 0 to 2 pi over 3. So the period here, or b, is 2 pi over 3. And I'm going to use that to calculate the k value. k is equal to 2 pi over period, which will be 2 pi over 2 pi over 3. When we flip and multiply, all that's left would be, yeah, Keaton, question? So up here it says b equals 2 pi over k, but why is k equal 2 pi over k? Oh, so that's not the This is just the rearranged version of this, right? But I want to find k so that I can plug it into the equation. OK, when I flip and multiply, the 2 pi's will cancel. I'll just be left with 3. That's it. There's the k value. All right, we're almost there. D of sine. Remember, guys, that the original sine function, let's look back at our sine function here. The original sine function actually starts at a midline and rises up from the midline. Do you guys remember this word, rising midline, from last year? Rising from the midline. So if I've penciled in the midline, I can find the D of sine wherever I start rising up into a mountain from the midline. So here's my midline. That's why I penciled it in. I'm looking for where, if I trace my graph left to right, where I start rising out from the midline. So where does that happen here? It's happening right here. This is the rising midline because it rises up from the midline from there. There's infinite options here. I can also say this if I want to. This is rising up from the midline as well. This also, I can say that too. Usually we just choose the closest one, right? So we're going to say pi over 6 to the right for d of sine. Who remembers how to get d of cos? Well, let's look back at our graph. Cosine normally starts at starts at a maximum, right? With transformations, that's going to change. It won't always be at 1, right? If I stretch it and I move it, it's going to change. But this is a maximum point. So if I find the location of the maximum for my graph here, that will tell me d of cos. So where is the closest max that we can see to the y-axis here? Pi over 3 happening here. That's d of cos. So for d of cosine, we will say pi over 3 to the right. And then we're just going to enter these into this skeleton equation for sine and cosine here. So enter in your a, k, d, and c. All right, so here's our functions. I'm going to say f at x equals the a value, which is 2. Let's do sine first. Sine of k, which is we found is 3, x minus d. So remember, when I have pi over 6 to the right, it will look like negative pi over 6 in my formula. And then c is positive 1, so we'll put plus 1 here. Similarly for cos, 2 cos of 3. So everything's the same except for the shift. 
And then if I want to say pi over 3 to the right, it should look like negative pi over 3 in my formula. OK? Do you guys remember doing this last year with your graphs? Yeah. So pretty much exactly the same, except now we're just using some radians instead of degrees. Keaton? So No. So if I were to, let's say I didn't have the graph and I wanted to graph the transformations, when I go to calculate my transformations, I would calculate them by doing 1 third k plus pi over 3. But I don't have to do that because I already have the graph, right? But yeah, we're going to do that in the next class. All right.